are very delighted to have with us today Professor Muna Makram Abed, who is a very distinguished Egyptian woman who has played very active roles in both the policymaking sphere and in academia in her country. Um, she is a former member of parliament and senator of Egypt, and she's a distinguished lecturer at the American University of Cairo. So, Muna, turning to you, we're going to talk today about women's rights and religious freedom and the rights of minorities in Egypt since the 2011 revolution that toppled former President Hosni Mubarak. Some people say that human rights and democracy, in, in those terms, that Egypt has come full circle rather than progressing towards a more open and free society since the 2011 revolution. First of all, what I see is that Egyptians have realized that to topple a president is not the end of the revolution. There is much more to it. And uh, so they're realizing that their expectations were a bit too high. There was a lot of promise in the air, of course, seeing all these young people, all the ages, all the generations, men and women, older, younger, uh, Christians and uh, Muslims. You know, this kind of cohesion, this social solidarity that you saw, uh, gave people a lot of uh, hope that there is a new page being turned. Now, following that, I believe, as many analysts have, that the revolution was hijacked by other actors, not by those who started it, which are the youth, really. Uh, it is not the Islamists nor the military who have started the revolution, but the youth. And, but as the youth were badly organized, didn't have a vision for the future, didn't have an alternative, um, it went out of hand somehow. And those who were better organized, better knew how to mobilize people behind them, like the Muslim brothers, were able to hijack the revolution. That's the first one. The second one is a different story. Second one is the result of a year of, uh, let's say, the Muslim brothers have exposed themselves, you know, for the first time. They were always playing on the victimization that they were, uh, that they were suffering from, from different governments, from different leaders. And suddenly, they found out that it's the people who are rejecting them for the first time in history. So there was no sympathy or empathy with them anymore. They saw through them. They saw that what they wanted was to change the identity of Egypt, to establish a theocracy, uh, a country that could be ruled by Sharia law, Islamic jurisprudence. And Egyptians, although they are very religious, both Christians and Muslims, they refuse to be dominated by clerics. They refuse to be told what to wear or when to pray or, you know. And it is this whole secular mien of the Egyptian people that uh, with, uh, had, the, had the Muslim brothers uh, gone on for more than a year, uh, it would have unraveled. And that's the scare. And that's the context in which President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi came in. So uh, it was, because I was part of it, calling on the army to help the people get rid of a government they thought would bring them back instead of getting them forward. And so about 22 million people came to the street. I was one of them. Uh, to ask for, because the ultimatum was given to P President Morsi before, either to uh, negotiate with the civil society or to have uh, earlier elections. They refused both. So it was time for the army to step in with the uh, 
with the support of the people. This is what happened then. Let's turn to women's rights. You've been active in Egyptian political life and also in their intellectual life as a woman for many years. Um, how do you see the situation of women having changed from before the revolution and then through the various phases of the revolution? What are women fighting for in today's Egypt? What have they gained? What have they lost since those early days of the revolution when women like yourself were playing a very leading role in Tahrir and hoping with a lot of optimism that their situation would be different and better in the future? Look, one thing that was quite uh, impressive is that Tahrir was a um, sexual harassment free zone during the revolution and during the 18 days in January and February, which was something new. Because as you know, um, after this, sexual harassment became rampant. And uh, as I said, during the Morsi times, uh, there was going to be um, a regression and going back to traditional practices like genital mutilation, all the things that we have been fighting against for the past 20 years. We fought against uh, genital mutilation and we managed to have it banned by the government. We fought against uh, uh, a, a young, you know, young marriages and the Muslim Brotherhood wanted to lower it to nine years old. We fought for the right of women to, to divorce, which is the khula, right of women. They wanted to abolish this and so on. So all the achievements that were made in the past 30 years, they wanted to abolish. But uh, the, the contradiction is the visibility of women in Tahrir. This is something totally new that women of all sorts, of all hues, came out that day, came out forcefully. I mean, they were at the forefront of the revolution and they asked, they were sick and tired, you know, of authoritarian governments, of the corruption that was happening, of the uh, oligarchy, let's say, because uh, the, the former president wanted to have his son succeed him. So all this uh, was a mixture that brought the people out to say enough is enough. And if you remember, there was a movement called Kefaya. When you were in Egypt, you must have attended that. So uh, I think that uh, <coughs> women's movement went up and down. For, for instance, as I said, the one thing that was striking was the visibility of women in, on, in Tahrir. In contrast, the invisibility of women in parliament. Only eight women were uh, elected and two were appointed in the first parliament that was uh, eventually dissolved. So this was a, a you know, real contrast and contradiction. Also, uh, ministerial positions where we thought, you know, that mm, women will be uh, given, you know, uh, a better positions in, uh, in the decision-making process, no. So there was the ups and downs, but when women were attacked in Tahrir, and I was again in this march, about 3,000 women came out on a march to uh, in protestation for what was happening. If you remember, it was this incident called the Blue Bra Girl. And uh, this was absolutely horrendous, uh, how this woman was maltreated in, in Tahrir. So the brutality of, uh, you know, there were thugs really who were there. You couldn't tell who was a thug, who was in the police, who was not, and so on. But there was certain brutality. Also, again, during the uh, Morsi period, there was an obsession with women's bodies, you know, particularly in the family laws. And as I told you, I mentioned three or four of these uh, uh, cultural practices that they wanted to uh, reinstall. Whereas women were fighting for less discrimination, more equality, 
uh, a change to the family law that would allow, um, like Morocco or Tunisia, and this morning I mentioned Tunisia, the fantastic leap forward that they made after the Arab Spring, which was the declaration of the President of the Republic that uh, Muslim women could marry non-Muslim men. And that was totally forbidden. But he based it on fiqh, on, you know, on jurisprudence, but with an enlightened interpretation. And this is what is happening today. People are mixing between Sharia and fiqh. And, and this is what is also um, part of, of the obstacles to reform of the family law and uh, Muslim jurisdiction in, uh, in general. Let's talk a little bit more about the sexual harassment issue. There have been many sort of innovative approaches to try and deal with this problem that have been put forth in the private sphere, including by young people. For instance, there was the harass map, which is something that I actually used when I was in Cairo, which is a very innovative online tool where women can go and report incidents of sexual harassment, put it on a map that can be accessed by other women so you can check in the morning before you go out and see if there were reports of incidents in your neighborhood. So the, there were some very creative solutions that came out, and particularly from the youth population in Egypt in response to this problem. But what do you think the policy approach is? Because there was a recent UN women study that showed that 99.3% of women in Egypt have experienced sexual harassment. So I wonder what do you think should be done at the policy level to help combat this issue and protect women as they're walking around on the street from sexual harassment? Look, what is missing is the political will. Once the political will, what happened in, uh, in Tunisia is because there was a political will to have, to give women more rights. Now, what you are saying is quite amusing because not only that, not only online, but the graffiti, the graffiti expressed the, uh, the, 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 the resistance of women and their claim to equal rights. And they made fun of the brutality of the, you know, they, made, they caricatured everything that happened. So it means that we cannot go back in history. We're going forward no matter what. No matter what the obstacles, that women are there and they're fighting for their rights. Women petitioned for a change to the constitution which could give them more rights. And th they did, in fact. The 2014 constitution gives women more rights, uh, protects them from violence, uh, 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 incriminates uh, sexual harassment, whether it is verbal or physical, uh, and, and many other articles that really uh, favor women. Now, the question is, are they being implemented or are they just articles in the Constitution? I think that until now, there is not much implementation of these articles. There is not much uh, respect for the Constitution or for the rule of law. Once this is uh, established, once people are, uh, you know, made accountable for their uh, crimes, because they are, these are crimes, you know, when you have uh, rapists or, uh, or otherwise, or even threats of, uh, of rape, these are crimes. And, and people should be accountable and should be punished. So until now, we don't see much of that. Let's shift focus to religious minorities in Egypt. Can you tell us about the situation of the Copts in Egypt? What kinds of threats are they facing today? How has their situation changed since the revolution? Copts, for the first time, came out from their, uh, what would you call, their safe haven, which is the church. They, you know, for years now, in the past years, they would all congregate in the church, which was uh, included their social activities, their uh, uh, academic activities, because they were taught uh, 
uh, courses and lessons. Anyway, they lived within the precincts of the church. For the first time, the youth came out. The youth came out uh, in Tahrir, although the Pope at the beginning asked them not to. He was a pro-Mubarak fellow, as you know, uh, but they did. And I encouraged them very much, you know, through the microphone and on the platform on Tahrir to come out. And they did. So for the first time, you feel that uh, Copts felt they, were, they had a stake in a new Egypt. They had a stake in a secular, modern, democratic Egypt. And that's why they were there. Now, what happened after that is that uh, with the ascendance of the political Islam, they felt quite concerned about their future. Um, the talks, the, 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 the sermons that were in, in the mosques, which called for, you know, which um, called them infidels. So as infidels, they could be killed or they could be brutalized uh, without any punishment. Also, their churches were burnt, particularly after the second revolution, which was the 30th of June that we were talking about, uh, in the retaliation for the strong support that the Copts gave to President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi. The Copts were among the strongest supporters and the new Pope, Pope Tawadros, appeared with the President on the 3rd of July. This, the Muslim Brotherhood and political Islam and ISIS and Daesh will not forget. That's why you have this wave of anti-Christian uh, slogans, persecution, and so on that have been going on for the past two years. So they don't feel, they, they, you know, people are afraid. They don't know what kind of situation they're in. Are they going to remain second-class citizens? Uh, are they going to be attacked in their country of birth? Uh, so there is a lot of concern, I must say, among the Coptic population today for the future. Uh, some of them have chosen, some of them felt that the message was either you become Muslim or you emigrate. And many of them have emigrated, in fact, uh, since the beginning of the revolution. Uh, I don't think many of them have become Muslim, but... Uh, uh, most of them, you know, like myself and my family, are staunchly uh, sticking to the homeland. And we believe that this is a passing wave. This, is particularly that, you know, the jihadist movement has been attacked by everyone today, so it has been weakened, I, I, I think. And then the majority of Muslims in Egypt do not uh, conform to this kind of uh, abuse. On the contrary, some of them are coming out more violently uh, against uh, such, uh, mm, such the perpetration of such acts of brutality and so on, burning churches, stealing jewelers' uh, shops, attacking, beheading. Did you, and you remember when uh, uh, 20 poor uh, uh, laborers were, were beheaded in Libya. And President Sisi sent immediately the next day uh, to bombard the place where they were. Uh. So that is why uh, President Sisi has a particular place in... Uh, th they felt more at ease when he came. First of all, he has a lot of gestures like being the first president to attend a mass. Uh, on Christmas, and people were euphoric. I was there also. Uh, also, uh, he ordered all the churches that have been destroyed and burned to be rebuilt by the, by the army. Uh, so there is, you know, um, ambivalent, uh, ambivalent attitudes because on the other hand, people think that the police are not quick enough to come when there is, a, when, when there is such a, 
tragedy, not incidents, like burning a church or like, uh, like you know, the latest uh, uh, um, accidents or tragic uh, happenings that happened at the beginning of this year in the cathedral and lately, two months ago, also in Minya. So they think that there is a bit of laxity on the part of uh, the police, and that means the government. So they, they, you know, they resent that. You mentioned political Islam, and I want to ask you about what you think the role of Islam is going to be in politics in Egypt in the future. Um, you know, separation of church and state is a principle that has worked in many countries, but what do you, is it possible to have secular majoritarianism in a place where a large or substantial portion of the population is deeply religious and does believe there is a role for religion in politics? And what is the model we have in the region for Islam and democracy to coexist? I mean, people used to say it was Turkey. I wonder if now maybe it's Tunisia, or is there another model in the region that you would point to where these things have managed to be reconciled in an effective way? Look, a totally secular in the Western sense, I don't think this can happen in the near future. But uh, in essence, Egyptians are secular. Uh, as I told you, they refuse to be dominated by clerics. They don't want people to tell them what, how to pray or, you know, they want to be free uh, to practice their religion, whether they're Christians or they're Muslims. Now, as, uh, as you said, we looked at, at Turkey as a model, you know, combining democracy and an Islamic country. But as you saw, it's a, it was, I don't know, a fiasco. That's what we see now. Uh, tu Tunisia was the second model that might have. I believe that Indonesia is a model. Indonesia has the biggest population, the biggest Muslim population. And yet it was able, in one way or another, to transit to democracy, uh, to have Islamic parties, but Islamic parties in conformity with the constitution, in conformity with the values of the country. That's what we're, we were asking the Muslim brothers. I am for having a, uh, an Islamic party. Because I think that Islam is, is rooted in, you know, you have three tendencies in Egypt. You have the liberals, you have the, the leftists, and you have Islam, Islamists. So I think that they should have had a, a, a party, but they, sh they must also respect the constitution, respect the, uh, the identity of Egypt as it is, not try to change it, and particularly respect the rule of law. They refuse to do this, and that's why it is the people who have rejected them this time, not the governments as it was in the past. And final question for you, Mwena, is about the future of U.S.-Egypt relations. Obviously, Egypt has a very important relationship with the United States. It has for decades received a significant amount of U.S. military aid. What do you think is going to happen with respect to human rights in that relationship with President Trump in the White House? Are, is there a concern that human rights could take even more of a backseat in the context of that relationship, given Trump's focus that's more narrow and more focused on counterterrorism and security cooperation? Exactly. Counterterrorism, security, and cooperation. So this is where they see eye to eye with President Sisi. Uh, unfortunately, yes, there is a feeling that because President Trump is not interested in human rights or encouraging a transition to democracy or any of the values that we've always seen uh, 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 represented by the United States of America. So there is a back, uh, you know, a sliding backwards, and this is not encouraging the Egyptian government to change. However, I believe, first of all, and this is what people don't seem to understand, that the United States is not a banana republic. The United States is based on institutions, and Trump is not alone to decide or to take uh, measures. 
you have Congress, you have the Pentagon, you have think tanks, you have the media, you have, you know, so many other instances, and you have Congress, which is the most important. So I believe that today there are voices in Congress. Uh, people say because they are against what happened in Egypt and the takeover uh, by the military and so on. Personally, this I always explain when I have to go there, uh, that this was a popular impeachment. You cannot say that it was a, take a military takeover because it's the people who asked the army to come out. This is one thing. On the other hand, for, the, for human rights, you know, I've been in the human rights movement for the past 25 years. I was one of the uh, founders of the Arab Organization of Human Rights. And then of, I was an elected member of the Egyptian uh, human rights when, when, when it was banned. Even the word human rights was banned uh, at the beginning of Mubarak's uh, term. But then at the end, they allowed more openness and there were many uh, human rights organizations. During Morsi's time, I was a member of the National Council for Human Rights. Of course, I didn't agree with anything that they said. And uh, we had to resign as we resigned from the Senate. This was all during Morsi's time. I believe that um, human rights, people are realizing that human rights is not just, you know, a parla parlance. No, it is tied to your everyday life, uh, the way you want to have people accountable, the way you want to have more freedom of choice, freedom of expression. All this goes without, within your rights. Uh, and so I believe that there will be um, a return, let's say, of the human rights movement. Many of the activists are left the country because they thought they will be um, either implicated in one way or another, like the other NGOs. And, uh, and don't forget the media, the, sorry, the IT is very, very um, active today. And they underline a lot of violations of human rights. So I believe that eventually, and I'm hoping to be a member of the next uh, Council on, of Human Rights, uh, which will be uh, organized uh, within a few days in, uh, uh, when Parliament reopens. So, uh, no, I have hopes, not for the moment. For the moment, no. But in the very near future, I think the movement of human rights will take up more uh, dynamism, particularly if it becomes more independent from the government. And it establishes networks with other human rights movements. Thank you so much for being with us, Mona, and I hope you'll visit us again soon. I hope to come back soon. I enjoyed it very much, and particularly this discussion and the discussion we had this morning with the students. <laughs>